But anyway, we're going to Revelation chapter 9 tonight with our continued study. It's been a well while since we've been in the Revelation. We have our paper. We have it on, I think there's been some copies laid out around everywhere. On the seven <coughs> sevens in the Revelation. And I won't take time to introduce all that, but you have the paper there. But we're in this series on the seven pro full proclaimed judgments in the Revelation. Wrote, taken in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. And you have the seven seal judgments which covers Revelation 6 through Revelation 8. Then comes along the seven trumpet judgments, Revelation 8 through Revelation chapter 11. And then the last set, the seven vile little bowls of God's judgment, taken in Revelation 16, verse 1 through 21. And each one of these judgments, when you come to the sixth one, it has a parenthetical passage between it and the seventh, like the seventh seal or the seventh trumpet judgment or the seventh uh, bowls of God's wrath. And we're seeing much of what that's all about. And we'll do that when we get to it on the lessons. And uh, we're going to be reading tonight Revelation chapter 9. And the reading portion concerns the sixth trumpet judgment. And these are wool trumpets because with Revelation chapter 8 under the fourth trumpet, he talks about a wool three times. And the word wool means wail well, or denunciation or great sorrow or trouble. And if there ain't enough of trouble that we're seeing in this lesson tonight, there's more on the way for those that are settled down in the world and that will be here for tribulation that's coming on this earth. And sometimes the devil hounds me with his preaching and teaching from the revelation. Sometimes it's questioned, why does God's people need to know about the revelation? Well, this is the one of the many uh, books in our Bible. And I often say, got to have a little bit of knowledge of the other 65 books to understand the 66th book, the Revelation. But God has promised a blessing upon those that will read and hear and, and, and those that will keep the sayings of this Revelation. We find it in Revelation, and I'll pray in just a moment. But in Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the, this prophecy and keep those sayings which are written Therein, for the time is at hand. And you say, what's blessed about hearing of blood and fire and smoke and brimstone and hail and bottomless pit and all, all that? What's blessed about that? Well, the Lord's bringing His Word into fulfillment and for the end time when He shall come back to this earth again. And it promises not only a blessing, but it proclaims a, well, it proclaims a warning, Revelation, and we're going to get right along with it tonight. Revelation 22 and verse number 18. He said, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So I'm not going to trifle with this book, the word of God, the revelation official. No, I'm not going to say that God's playing footsie with man. No, I'm not going to say that this is just a fairy story and you don't have to take, take notice of it. I'm saying it's real and literal. And sometimes God uses symbols and signs in the revelation because he's dealing with Israel. And we're going to find out a lot of things in, in the study. And I'm kind of just 
jumping through the the tulips, as Brother Danny Jenkins said, giving you some of the highlights. Not going down real real depth and in real deep, but I'm trying to get our hearts to see this thing of wrath that's coming on a Christ-rejecting world. It ought to be an insane. It ought to be something that would cause our hearts to turn to God and pray for our friends, our family, people that we know that's going to be left behind if they don't get regenerated and born again and under the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, it ought to be an incentive to cause us to pray for them. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Paul said it this way in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That means we beg. We beg men but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. Oh, I tell you, we need to really know something about what's going down, down the way in Bible prophecy. This prophetic book of the Revelation. But I'm going to pray that we're going to read some tonight. And Father, I come to thank you on this Sunday evening. Lord, as I come to this great Task and Lord, I admit, Lord, I'm not, I'm not where I ought to be, Lord, in being able to to expound this in a full way to get people to understand. And Lord, I'm doing my best to try to, Lord, and follow the Spirit of God and those that I read after, and Lord, to rightly divide Your Word and get it set right, Lord, that nobody, I tell you, nobody go off wondering what's been said. Do you be all honor and glory. And I pray you'll help us, Lord, in the quietness of this evening in this small congregation. Lord, that our hearts might take it in and be reminded, Lord, that you're a God of wrath. You're a God that bringeth judgment upon mankind that's unsaved. And I pray you'll bless your word as we read and expound. And do you be all honor and glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now we're looking at these second sets of judgments under these trumpet judgments. And we're reading under the sixth trumpet of Revelation 9 and verse 13. And I don't know as I'll have time to do any review, but I'm going to read some of this tonight and to get us a starting place and obey the Lord. But here we're seeing the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now we read about it in Revelation chapter 8. We read about the, the golden altar and the, the golden censer and the prayers of the saints and that takes us all the way back with with Moses and the tabernacle of old and of course coming along the, the temple that Solomon made and all these things are fit for he's dealing with his people Israel as he brings them through the fires of the tribulation that is out of head. And of course there's going to be a remnant of Israel that will be saved and we're seeing here uh, this golden altar right here in Revelation 9, 13. He said, which is before God. And John hears a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. John is the seer. God is the sayer. And if you're a student of the Word of God, you're those that are getting educated. And what's coming down the way in the way of tribulation and judgment and wrath from an almighty God. But he said, saying to the sixth angel in verse 14, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river of Euphrates. Now that connects us now and gets us a little bit of a little bit of of information of where this is taking place at. The Phratis is is there in the east, the far east at, uh, of Israel, and uh, in in well, where 
Baghdad, Iraq is really in that area. Of course, uh, history says this is no doubt somewhat of the place where the Garden of Eden was and where the first sin was committed and, and where a lot of things that began to take place in the fact of, of the fall of the creature of Adam that brought down the human race. But here in this same area is the stronghold of Babylon of the past. You know, it was Genesis chapter 11 and they had erected a tower to heaven trying to get away to and the first ecumenical movement started in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. And this thing has immersed and, and I tell you, kept on going down through the history of time with, with Revelation 17, with, a, with religious Babylon that God's put His doom on, and Revelation 18 that God's put His doom upon political Babylon. All this is coming to a head one of these days when the great I am, the stone that Daniel talked about, cut out of them and will strike the Gentile world, powers and bring them down into judgment. But here we're seeing the great river of Euphrates that divides really the east from the west. And he said the four angels were loose which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year and for to slay the third part of men. And we've already we've already studied, if you remember your, your Bible and go back and look at it, we've already studied a fourth of men were killed. We look at we looked at it right here in Revelation chapter number eight. We saw under the first trumpet judgment Hail and fire mingled with blood, cast to the earth, and third part of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass burned up. The second angel, a great mountain burning with fire, literally coming right to this earth, cast into the sea. Third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died, and the third part of ships were destroyed, and on and on destruction and devastation that's going on right here on this earth. And I'm glad we're not going to be here. We that are saved. You say, well, why deal with it? Well, we need to remind our people what's out ahead. Remind people that God's going to be true to His work. But here in Revelation chapter number 9, under this sixth trumpet, He said, and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year were to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of a horseman were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And here we have a number, 200 million people. I'm telling you, that could make up, well, the fourth of the population would be China, and India and Japan, all three of these countries could put together 200 million. It really could. And here we're seeing this great army, a number, 200 million. And thus, John said, I saw the horses in the vision and them that sit on them, having breastplates of fire and of sand and brimstone and the heads of the Horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. You're reading, right? What I'm reading on this evening. And I, I mentioned in Revelation chapter number 8, all when we was in Revelation chapter 8, and the first portion of Revelation chapter 9, these are living creatures that come out of the smoke that comes out of the bottomless pit of hell, I must tell you, all living creatures demonized, Satan energized, if you please, and I don't know what's all incorporated with that, but these are horrible monstrosities that come out of the smoke that comes out of the bottomless pit that's mentioned in the first portion under the woe 
of the fifth trumpet, all that comes out. I'm telling you, they come out all of the ab abyss, we call it. It's kind of like a shaft that runs from the earth to the, the, to the underworld, down to the heart of the earth, and connects with hell and hell fire. And all that's, that's the reason you see the volcano explosions and hells moving toward the earth. All Solomon said, hell is never full. It's moved to meet those that are coming there. Oh, I tell you, you never see where God is increasing the size of heaven, but hell is increasing to occupy the multitudes that will one day be there. And of course, for the lake of fire that's out ahead, the eternal uh, damnation of mankind that rejects Christ. But here we're seeing literal preachers. I tell you, with resemblances of literal animals that are on the earth now, coming out of the smoke that comes out of the bottomless pit. But again, this 200 million horsemen and the horses, and all oh, I remind you, this is a horrible monstrosity. All oh, horses in the vision. And John sees them in verse 17, having breastplates of fire and of sand and in brimstone. And the heads of the horses were of the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And I'm stopping it and I'm just not going to go on any further but, but, without saying what I need to say on this evening. And the same God that spared not Sodom and Gomorrah is the same God that's not going to spare the world that settled down and will be in this awful time of tribulation. Now we're holding our place and looking at Second Peter chapter number 2. And look at your Bible in verse 4. And if God spared not the angels, and He did not. No, He did not spare the angels that sinned. Those that joined with Lucifer when he fell. Those that left their own habitation. He said He's cast them down to hell. And delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto Judgment, and if you remember the seven judgments that I preached on when I first come here the last time, and one of them was the judgment upon fallen angels. And as we speak on this evening, they're chained up in chains of darkness, reserved for a day of judgment by a sovereign God. But he said he not only spared not the angels, and he spared not the old world. But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Oh, what about that? God that was grieved, a world that was continually, I take on it, set on evil continually, and their wicked imagination, a lot of things that are going on, that was going on in Noah's day are being repeated in our day God's reminded us as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man all they were building cities and, and living it up and laughing and scorning and making light of God's judgment that it's going to bring Noah a preacher of righteousness I don't know per se whether he was a preacher like myself but he was out there working on that ark and building that ark. And old God said, I'm going to send a universal. And God didn't say universe, but he, he, he grounded the whole universe. I tell you, with a flood upon the world of the un-God. He spared not the old world. The same God that spared not the angels. The same God that spared not the old world. But it said in verse 6 of 2 Peter 2, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, 
making them an example unto those that after should live on God. And all oh, I tell you, the gays and the lesbians, the perverts, that crowd that do that which is unnatural, that crowd, I'll tell you this, and then I'll tell you, coming out of the closet in our day, days, and you can't hardly turn on the TV, you, you turn on the internet and see that wicked crowd parading themselves around, but oh, I'm reminding you, they're wicked sinners, exceedingly, God's done, wrote it down in this Bible, God ain't gonna let it get let, let them get by. They didn't get by in Lot's day. They didn't get by in Noah's day, and they'll not get by in the tribulation. God's gonna put them. I tell you, put them where they're they're needing to go. Oh, I tell you, the wrathful God, and we see that in Romans chapter one, in light that the revelation of His wrath, His wrath is revealed upon those that hold back the, the, I tell you, and, and say there ain't nothing to this righteous God. And oh, I tell you, he's a wrath. The wrath of God's revealed in Romans chapter 1 against the perverse. But we're seeing right here on the pages of the Word of God tonight, this 200 million horsemen that's going to ride out and he's going to open up the that loose the four angels in the great river of Euphrates, and no doubt, without any doubt, I'm favored. And, 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 and Napoleon said of, of years gone, he said, don't wake up the sleeping giant, that's child, and she's been woke up. And all oh, he said, oh, what an awful time it would be. And Napoleon in his day, oh, when you wake up the sleeping giant, child, all the, the generation that's going to be really in trouble. And one of these days they're going to march toward Israel. And God's going to uh, open the great river of Euphrates and let them come from the east, no doubt, with China and India and Japan coming down to take a spoil, coming down to try to do away with Israel. But I'm glad I've read the end of the book. And the great I am, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be there to intervene for His people, Israel, and put His enemies literally under His feet. But these horses now in verse 17, all we're seeing the blood and the fire and the smoke and the brimstone to remind us that God is a God of wrath. The same God that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is going to bring destruction upon the inhabitants of the earth, those that have settled down in the world. And I'm not in this pulpit. If you love sports, that's okay, as long as it don't come between you and the Lord. But I was looking at yesterday, all, all those thousands of people sitting there watching the ball game. And again, I'm not striking out if you love sport, but I'm saying I've seen all those thousands of people, and I wonder, how many of that crowd will be those that will be left for the awful day of wrath here upon this earth? Oh, it ought to make your heart cry out and plead for the soul of men for the awful time that's coming down the way. They have no idea whatsoever what's coming. But I'm, I'm reading it right here in the Bible. As I said, God ain't playing pussy. Oh, God, I tell you, just tell me like it's going to happen. Amen. But he said in these horses, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And all oh, you say, I just can't get a hold of it. No, it's really hard to comprehend. But God's put it in this Bible, and God has already got Got, got it laid down. He's already get, got the instruments to bring down those that are settled into the world. But look at verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues. That's bad enough for the plague of the locusts that come out of the smoke, that come out of the bottomless pit, that torment men five months and they'll pray to die and cannot die. If that ain't enough, 
But it said these that were not killed were these plagues that will come from those horses all of that day yet repented not of the works of their hands and they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. And what a horrible time it will be. I tell you, when the world is turned loose with Satan's lie, the Antichrist, and I tell you, verse 21 says it all. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And I tell you, in the late day, Dr. J. Vernon McGee used to say, and I've got his books, and he'd say, if man was to paint up the town, he can man, and all the world be turned loose, and drugs, and fornication, and adultery, thefts, any, any wicked sin you could think of on this evening will be in action during that awful time of tribulation. People trying to trying to get trying to die, taking drugs and all all the incest and wickedness that's going on, all that the devil can put together. He's going to have a heyday, and I tell you, he's going to use drugs and all this other stuff to and liquor and, and beer and all all the attractiveness that he can for the lust to feel, try to fulfill their lust and, and try to pass off the judgment of God. But oh, it said they repented not. Oh, it said they repented not of their murders and their sorceries and their fornication, nor of their thefts. And I say as this, this passage closes on this evening, man ain't going to repent without God. I mentioned here, I think, Wednesday night or last maybe last weekend, and a lot of, full, lot of fundamental preachers, you would not believe, that thinks this saying of repentance is a work of man, but it's a work of God. You cannot repent without God grants you repentance. Romans chapter 2. Amen. I say amen to the truth on this evening. Repentance comes from God. Romans 2 said the goodness of God leadeth thee to repent. But in this tribulation period, and we're going to see it again coming up in Revelation 16, all oh, when God sends His awful wrath and their pains and, and I tell you, all the intensity that He can put upon me, and still they're going, they're going to blaspheme the very name of God and repent not. And I'm reading it, Revelation 16 before we close tonight. Let's look at this as we kindly go along with Revelation chapter number 9. But look at Revelation chapter 16 under these last set of judgments, the judgment of the vials of God's wrath. But in Revelation 16 and verse 10, under the fifth vial, and the fifth angel, angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And that lets you know man ain't going to repent on his, on his own. Oh, it'll be the goodness of God that'll lead men to repentance. That's what brought my heart to call upon the Lord and side with, repentance means to side with God that you wronged Him. And we have. We wronged We crucified the Lord of glory. As I mentioned in the Sunday school this morning. And oh, that's one of the, the, I tell you, the determining factors when I got born again. Oh, I took my, my place as a guilty, lost sinner and said, Lord, I wronged you. I nailed you to an old rugged cross. My sin has brought you to that place. And now I'm calling on you, Lord, to bring salvation to my heart. But all the tribulation period, no, they're not. Uh, the more they, they, the Lord puts wrath on them, the more they're going to blaspheme it. All oh, they're not going to repent of their evil deeds. And all oh, being man, being often reproved, Solomon said, 
Oh, I tell you, let's look at that in closing tonight. And I think I gave it to you on the last lesson here in the Revelation. But it's in Proverbs 29 and verse 1, if my memory is correct. And I will try to close on this verse tonight. But look what Solomon penned down, the inspired Word of God. And he said, He that being often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Oh, I tell you, no remedy for man, I tell you, that will forsake God, just go right on in his sin, and God will see to it. God will see to it in the tribulation. All that have heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus in this good age of grace, this, this, this day of mercy, oh, everybody will turn it down. God's going to see to it that in the tribulation they'll believe the lie, the antichrist, and be doomed and down forever. What an awful indictment upon mankind. God's put it down in this book, the wrath of God. Oh, when we started Revelation 6, all oh, that phrase, the wrath of the Lamb is come, and who shall be able to stand? Oh, I read it in Psalms here lately. Psalms 1. Oh, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Oh, it's awful. On this evening, in order to make our heart break down and be burdened for those that are unsaved tonight. Oh, all week, all this week, my heart's been going to Romans chapter number 9. And verse 1, where Paul said, I wish myself a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now I wonder how far we could say with that statement tonight for our own families and our own friends all around us. Oh, I tell you, we need to pray. God put a far under us. God put a burden on my heart. Don't let us sleep. We try to warn everybody we can. And we're responsible. I'm telling you we're responsible for the people around us. Amen. For those that are unsaved. Father, I pray on this evening.